Excellent. So uh, this is a design from Trust Call on Friday, January 18th, 2019. Our guest is Toby Lowe uh, from the UK, from uh, Newcastle University, but, the, but which business school? The so I, I now work for Northumbria University. Northumbria, sorry, yes. Newcastle Business School. Newcastle Business School. And the nomenclature is difficult, but there we are. Like, because there's also a Newcastle University right next door. Excellent, good. So now that that's clear. Um, we have a, a really fascinating topic. Um, I will uh, let Toby take us into the topic in a second. And just to, to frame things, uh, design from trust is uh, a way of looking at trust that uh, is kind of, kind of real. Uh, you, as, as it, it showed up for me a, a couple of years ago when I realized looking at institutions around us that most of the are modern institutions, which we often assume are as, as good as they could be designed, are designed for mistrust of the average person. Our compulsory education system is called compulsory because we can compel you to put your child in school, whereupon we immediately put them in lockstep with other kids of the same age and sort of almost gape them away from kids of different ages, even though we suspect somewhere in the back of our minds that it's a pretty good thing to learn or teach you know, kids other, other ages uh, and so forth. And that becomes a special thing, men mentoring or tutoring, in instead of just the way that, that school is done. Whole series of other ways in which uh, mistrust creates scarcity uh, and also in which mistrust uh, replaces intrinsic motivation with extrinsic rewards. And I think that's a, a key piece of, of the conversation we'll have here. Um, and with that, let me turn it to Toby to, to sort of unpack the call. Let me add that, that uh, half the people on the call here have been collaborating with Toby on fleshing out these ideas. Uh, and so this is a, in some sense a practitioner's call, uh, not just kind of an intro call. So um, Toby, take it away. Thank you, Jerry. Um, so where should I start? I'll, I'll just say a little bit about the kind of background to the work and the kind of link, I think, between um, working in complexity and the need for trust. Uh, so my background is uh, I used to be a, a, a voluntary sector and not-for-profit chief executive. I got frustrated with how funding and performance management landscape was working uh, and the, the landscape that we were being asked to work within, particularly when the public bodies that we started working with um, uh, adopted the kind of outcomes based accountability framework. Because uh, in our experience, kind of long story short, when they adopted that uh, outcomes based accountability framework, it created a situation where people stopped telling the truth to each other. Um, I thought, so I thought, how can, we must be able to do better with this, uh, better than this for funding and performance management. Um, and uh, so we, we I, I did, uh, a bit, I began a relationship with uh, the business school at Newcastle University. They asked me to do some research on this and we found that um, uh, basically outcomes-based performance management uh, fails to work in complex environments. Uh, if you try and hold organizations accountable for producing outcomes, um, effect effectively you're holding them accountable for things they don't control, and so they learn to manage what they can control, which is the production of data. So, and there's just, there's a ton of research studies that back this up. So it doesn't matter in what policy context in which country, if people adopt outcomes-based performance management approaches like payment by results, I think you call it payment for success in the, in the United States, um, it creates the drivers for gaming. So what could we do differently? Um, we, so in order to kind of work out what an alternative looked like, we asked some of the organizations, some charitable foundations, some public sector commissioners, uh, people who uh, have resources to spend in order to achieve social good. We asked them what their experience of and, and response to complexity is. 
Uh, and so we asked them, how do they respond to the fact that people's lives are complex, that everyone's life is different? And so if you're trying to create positive outcomes in their life, you need to respond to the variety of that. Uh, how do you respond to the uh, intertwined nature of the problems, that, uh, the social challenges that, that we face? So the fact that homelessness isn't just an issue about housing, it's also frequently an issue about mental health problems and maybe substance misuse and domestic violence violence and 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 how do you respond to the uh, to the fact that the the number of people and organizations um, uh, involved in uh, helping people to um, uh, kind of get their lives on track are there's there's such a huge variety of organizations public sector organizations private sector organizations voluntary sector organizations civil society friendship groups and networks it's a whole tangled mess of people intervening in different ways and if you if you want to kind of visualize what that complex system looks like that creates an outcomes in people's lives i'll just see if i can paste uh, um, uh, a little figure into the chat thing that illustrates that oh, no, apparently i can't uh, if you can't paste you can also screen share so if you oh. want to try that Ooh, how do I do that? Uh, if mouse, mouse over the screen where you see all of us, and then at the bottom it says share. Uh, okay, uh, mouse gallery view um, more. If you just mouse right over the over the screen, you'll get a menu that pops up below. The menu that's not visible when your mouse is not over the the screen. Make that bigger. Uh, gallery view mouse over. Not, not showing up yeah, for you. There we go. There we go. Share my screen. A yeah. small technology triumph. I love it. There we are. Share. I was going to try mind control next, but I'm glad I didn't have to go to that. <laughs> so, what you see here um, uh, is the um, systems map of obesity which shows, uh, it was a work done by the UK government in 2007, um, shows all the different, 108 different factors that they mapped in producing the outcome of obesity, so whether people are obese or not. And you'll see it contains in it, you can't, you can't see any of the individual factors because they're too small, that, but yeah, you see them summed up in things like early life experiences, food production and supply, macroeconomic drivers, education, technology, nature of work healthcare, blah, 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 all these different factors. These, all these contribute to making up the outcome of whether people are obese or not. But if you look in the bottom right hand corner of that um, system map, you'll see um, kind of four factors associated with healthcare and treatment options. So if you're a funder and commissioner, those are the things that you would attempt, you would generally fund or commission. But if you do that on a kind of payment for, payment by results or payment for success basis, basically what you're saying is you're trying to hold those people at that tiny part of the system accountable for the behavior of the system as a whole. And if you hold to what you're trying to do is hold people accountable for things they don't control. And if you try and hold people accountable for things they don't control, if you fail because they learn to manage what they can control, which is the production of data. So that kind of payment by success, uh, um, uh, mechanism if you operate that in a complex environment it just turns everyone's job into the production of good-looking data mm. rather than doing the job at hand um, so how do I stop stick share pause share up at the top yeah uh, um, so um, uh, what um, uh, having diagnosed that um, in complex environments, you need something else. We spoke with a number of uh, these uh, funders and commissioners who had decided to do things differently. And we asked them what their experience of and response was to complexity. Um, and when we asked them that question, they started to talk about relationships and trust. Uh, and some of the people we asked on, uh, that question to and gave us that response are on this call right now. So you, uh, you can kind of uh, get their different experiences from this. Um, and Basically, what, what they seem to say is that um, uh, because in a complex, uh, the, one of the features of a complex environment is unpredictability. So you can't set performance targets in advance and know what the impact on that system is going to be. 
So you can't have that control mindset that is the paradigm on which almost all performance management is based on. So you need to let go of the illusion of control if you're going to um, uh, promote positive performance of kind of public services and other social interventions in complex environments. And so what enables those with resources to distribute to let go of the illusion of control seems to be the idea of trust. Um, and when we dug into what that means for people, um, essentially it's trust in the intrinsic motivation of those who do the work. So we as funders, we as commissioners, trust that the people, the organizations that we're working with are intrinsically motivated to do a good job. They don't need the, the uh, extrinsic motivation of reward and punishment in order to do the right thing. And that, that trust opens up the idea that it's learning that becomes the engine for performance improvement. So if you want, if you want to enable people to get better at what they do, you create learning environments where people's desire for mastery, people's desire to achieve a higher purpose, creates the drivers which enables them to, um, uh, to improve their performance. I mean, you then, as organizations, you, it, it's really important what kind of learning mechanisms you build around those things. And so this is, I think, where the kind of design uh, there's, there's really interesting potential to bring together the design from trust stuff with this stuff of, of about learning as the engine for performance improvement because how what I'm interested in is how those two sets of ideas fit together so what are the um, the learning mechanisms that enable people to build on trust as a mechanism for performance improvement um, and so I, I, I feel like that's probably enough by way of introduction because there are now a number of people and organizations on this call who can talk much more eloquently than I can about how they use these as a set of practices to support their organizational work. So we um, uh, got Richard from the Tudor Trust, uh, John from uh, uh, the Whitman Institute, Gary from uh, Plymouth Council can all talk a little bit about how they do this stuff. Um, um, that's fantastic. Uh, Toby, that's a, like really a, a sparkling stellar intro to the, to the topic. Um, maybe I'll pause for a second to see, I mean, I, I'm on board, but I, I want to see who has questions here. Uh, questions about what got presented so far don't take us any deeper in because we want to sort of uh, t uh, open up open up the topic a little bit more. But anybody have a question right now to clarify what Toby's presented? We're good. Okay, you can also um, click on there's a raise hand function in Zoom, and if you do that, I will I will notice it. So on from there. Um, so let me do a tiny piece on design from trust with a, with a footnote first, I typed it into the chat, but there is a whole bunch of knowledge in the room here about mapping complex problems. Uh, Kevin Jones, who's on the call, had a, a company and a project called Ziggy, X-I-G-I, 15 years ago, Kevin? I don't know, I don't remember how long ago, 15, 20 years ago, that was busy mapping social problems and trying to figure out who was doing what for whose benefit where and who had invested in whom, all those kinds of things, right? What, what are the funding links? What are the, what are the problem nexuses? Nexi, nexuses? Right. <laughs> uh, Kevin, do you want to describe it for a sec? Uh, yeah, we really depicted the relationships in a marketplace. So <clears throat> who funded who with what kind of money and what did they produce? And um, in this emerging market of social enterprise and impact investing, people loved it and, and put a lot of things into it. And one of the things we did that was kind of unique, I haven't seen other people do, is that we went from the personal to the organizational and back. And so you could see an investor, their nonprofit boards, their board memberships with other people and those sorts of things. Uh, and uh, it was great. It was, it was un unfortunately, uh, before uh, there was really a market. So, you know, I, you were it, early. It, it, I, it was too early. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, Closed it down. It got covered by spam. 
Nice. And uh, separately from that, I'm, I'm in extremely current conversations, like one happened yesterday, uh, with a bunch of people who are doing system mapping around thorny problems like food supply and so forth, using a tool called Kumu, uh, which some of you may know. Toby, you're probably familiar with it. But I have gotten to know some black belt Kumu users who do these beautiful, rich system diagrams. And part of what we're looking at is, in fact, uh, we're putting together a proposal to get funding to do uh, mapping, for example, of the uh, Columbia River Gorge area from a food systems perspective. Uh, and then from other, you know, other kinds of systems as well. And then to see how this, how the map actually helps people do, I think, some of the stuff that we're going to talk about here in the rest of the call. So that's, that's a super interesting piece. And then let me do a screen share of my own for a second because um, I've been using this tool called The Brain for 21 years. And uh, by way of explanation of design from trust and all those kinds of things, here are a bunch of examples of uh, what I call the relationship economy uh, in action. Uh, so there's, a, let's see, Democrat. So for example, um, there's a thing called workplace democracy which is a, an umbrella term for a whole series of different things that have to do with trust of your employees. So we don't actually trust our employees. We, we, you know, most companies are autocratic, hierarchical. Most people are on the clock, think Fordism, Taylorism. Uh, that is still really like companies in the 80s and 90s figured out uh, how to squeeze out all of the slack from their companies, get rid of all the assistance, et cetera, and make everybody do 120% of their job. So there's a whole series of initiatives uh, from worker co-ops to uh, liberated companies to a uh, holacracy and a, a bunch of other initiatives that are examples of trust at work. Um, there's something called unschooling. Uh, it helps when you spell it properly. Uh, so there's something called unschooling, which is sort of the opposite of this compulsory education system, uh, which is uh, trusting your, that your children are curious and trusting that they're trying to figure out their role in the world uh, and uh, figuring out how to scaffold their learning because they're born curious. Mm -hmm. Little kids are learning machines and we kind of uh, forgot that, right? So I can come back to design from trust in different ways. And, and partly what I'm really interested in is um, how to create a practice of design from trust that anybody could pick up and go use uh, at a corporate level, at a social impact nonprofit government level, and at a personal level. Because I think that there's also um, design from trust is very much about personal attitude. That um, there's, a, there's a saying from open source and, and other places that, um, that really encapsulates nicely what design from trust is about, which is assume good intent. Um, and assume good intent is lovely because assume good intent doesn't say, hey, be like, you know, be blind that everybody showing up has good intent. It doesn't say that. It says assume good faith as a start, as an, as an opening salvo. Um, and that usually leads you really good places. And the, the problem is that a, a bunch of people in the world believe that people are born evil and therefore need to be constrained and, and, and ruled. And I, think, I think partly what we're saying here is if you cross your fingers, uh, you know, close your eyes and, and begin with a gesture of trust, you get to really good places. And what I've discovered is that's what, what I have here under examples of the relationship economy in action, hundreds of movements around the world um, that have discovered these principles separately on their own and that have actually applied them, which is why I want to turn it back to you, Toby. Um, to introduce whoever you'd like from the people uh, you've been working with uh, to tell us some stories about uh, how that, what this looks like on the ground. Yeah. Um, uh, so it kind of in, it's been my privilege over the last two years or so to start talking in depth with organizations who, uh, in, in the kind of language that I had originally used, um, uh, adopted kind of complexity informed ways of working different organizations you have their own language around this um, and uh, they're all in, all in different ways using the prince using this idea of let's start from trust as a way to um, uh, as a starting point for our assumptions about the relationship between us with money to distribute and the people who we might support to achieve social good. Um, I suppose it would be natural for me to start by introducing John because John uh, and the Whitman Institute um, uh, 
they brand what they do as trust-based philanthropy. So, uh, John, would you like to say something about that? Uh, sure. Thanks, Toby. Um, and I'll just try and keep it brief because I know there's a lot of us on the call. Um, uh, Whitman Institute is a foundation in San Francisco, uh, founded in 88, but we started making grants in 2005. And uh, I was the only full-time staff for uh, over a decade. Now I'm the co-executive director. There's two of us full-time staff. Um, we have a portfolio uh, that's kind of multi-issue based, but it's around advancing equity and social justice, um, but funding work that we think really lifts up the importance of dialogue and relationship building uh, and linking that to uh, processes of community and civic engagement, uh, journalism and media, leadership development, a whole human rights, whole penalty of, of issues. <clears throat> and where our, when, when we first started doing grant making, there were just some practices we inherently did. We didn't call them anything, but it was uh, unrestricted funding was a, a pillar. It's if we're supporting you, you know how best to spend the money, here it is. Um, and we found just with that step, uh, it was important to, to Jerry, your point, it was starting from an implicit place of trust rather than distrust, which is often how nonprofits uh, interpret their beginning relationships with foundations where there's some, okay, what's the proposal? What's the control? What's the reporting gonna be? And that most of the funding is project-based funding rather than unrestricted funding. Um, so right from the beginning, um, uh, that was a core part of our approach, as was support over time, uh, making multi-year commitments, um, streamlining reporting, not requiring the usual things, and, and having an invitation to relationship. Uh, so in 2012, we made the decision as a foundation to spend out as a foundation in 2022. So one of our first things we thought we would do is, is um, helping inform how we looked at our, our final chapter was we contracted with the Center for Effective Philanthropy um, to do what's called the Grantee Perception Report. Uh, standardized survey compared to other foundations where um, you get anonymous feedback from the people you're supporting. Um, so one, one big learning from that was very affirming in that we were kind of off the charts in a positive way um, in terms of how we did our work and our grant making and our relationships with the people we supported. Um, and then we had an open-ended question we could, that we were able to ask. Um, and so we asked people their ideas about how we might best leverage our resources as we looked to spend out. Uh, and it came through kind of loud and clear. People thought we should advocate for what and how we fund. And then what was interesting uh, and informed uh, our work going forward is uh, CEP said, but we also want to highlight this comment that keeps coming up in, in people's, uh, uh, or thread that keeps coming up in people's comments. And that, that's how important it is that they feel trusted by you. So when we heard that feedback, combined with what we were actually hearing from a lot of people that we were supporting, working in communities, working across issues, across difference, how important trust was before they could do anything, we took that feedback <clears throat> combined with this urge to advocate within philanthropy and named our practices as trust-based philanthropy. And so uh, we, these, and, and what's interesting, none of the things we are advocating for are new. People have been making the case for these for a long time, but many of them prove stubbornly resistant to uh, widespread change. So what we have found in the last couple of years is that 
keep, and this is anecdotal and small, but our own experience, is that people are responding and have responded to the framing uh, of trust. And so what's happening for us now is we're looking to our spend out and how we're thinking of our legacy is we're committing to helping contribute to an informal network of foundations and nonprofits who are both practicing in this way that we feel embodies trust and also advocating for it within, within philanthropy. So we have now over the past year, kind of that first follower thing, we had two other foundations who kind of who said, and these were newer e, uh, EDs, we want to use that language and framing to talk about how we do our work and we want to advocate along with you. So we have now started what we're just, what we're calling the Trust-Based Philanthropy Network. And it's kind of a community of practice um, of funders who are both practicing these principles in their own foundations and everybody has some different ways of doing it. And we want to learn, we're committed to being ambassadors and advocates and sharing what we're learning there. So we now have five foundations in this network based on a meeting we did in September. Um, and we uh, are doing a similar meeting uh, in New York, uh, the end of February. And so where we're at at the moment is, is trying to nurture and grow this both practitioner and advocacy network um, around trust-based philanthropy. Um, and so uh, that's why I was really uh, uh, excited to hear about uh, Jerry, what you were doing with this. And I have to ask you, were you involved in this Seattle Design Festival? I was not. Check that out. And it was all around trust and designing for trust. I, I mention it because after this September meeting I, we had with foundations, one of the people in our group, he said, well, I was in Seattle and just by happenstance walked on this kind of up, this pop-up uh, art installation around designing from trust. So, um, so I would, I'll, I'll just end there. We have found that approaching our work from trust, and I, I like the distinction you make, Jerry, of designing from trust, not for trust, um, that that has been very powerful in, in our work. And I think Maybe it's because we're in such times of massive distrust on so many levels. People are, they're being invited in with uh, trust. And I think it grounds what can be, maybe sound academic or uh, too uh, intellectual. It grounds it in a relational frame that I think people can respond to. and and. So anyway, so that's, and so we were thrilled when Toby contacted us now a couple years ago for the report. Um, and we're just in this mode of wanting to connect and network uh, as much as we can to just help build a wider uh, movement around um, making this case. Thank you, John. Um, I think uh, kind of want to bring that into a UK context now and maybe invite Richard to talk a little bit about um, the practices of the Tudor Trust, which is a UK based charitable foundation that kind of shares some of that philosophy with, with Whitman Institute, although it wouldn't badge itself as that kind of trust-based philanthropy at the moment. And uh, Susan, Susan has raised her hand. Can we, can we pause for a second and take Susan's question and then uh, come back? Go ahead, Susan. You are muted and uh, presently unmuted. How about that? There we go. Um, yeah, just a, just a quick question. So, and maybe this just goes back to Toby. Um, Toby's interested in why he's here. Um, have you consciously done any 
mm, documentation of the practice of becoming a, <laughs> developing the practice of being coming a, I know this is ridiculous, but uh, the, meta, the meta thing, right? Because that's a real developing, I'm, I'm thinking on behalf of Jerry as well, because um, that's a place where I've had lots of experience in developing practice for design, but, <laughs> but anyway, just wondering what you're doing about that part. Um, yeah, so um, uh, exactly. we're, we're doing now, we're in, in the UK we've started a research project uh, funded by the Tudor Trust, thanks again Richard, um, uh, which looks at um, trying to do two things basically, uh, to try and deepen our understanding of what complexity informed funding and commissioning looks like, which you could read as a shorthand for trust based uh, funding and commissioning. Um, and also what the journeys look like that enable organizations to get there. So we've just started that as a research process. We've um, been working alongside organizations working this way for, uh, for about six months now. Um, and uh, we're about to publish a second report, a kind of follow up to that whole new world report, which describes a kind of our learning so far on deepening that understanding of what the practice looks like and what the journeys are that enable the organization to get there so if all goes well we'll publish that uh february march time thank you um so back to you in the booth toby if you want to uh, play air traffic controller for your guests uh, yes yeah, so um uh, uh as i was saying before um kind of moving this from a, a, a US uh, foundation context to a UK foundation context, I just kind of wanted just it to invite Richard to uh, maybe say a little bit about how trust features uh, in how the Tudor Trust does its work. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Toby. Um, it's fantastic to be part of this conversation. I'm really excited, John, to hear about the, uh, the, the philanthropy network um, that sounds really um, helpful because it does feel a bit like a, a lonely, weird um, journey, I think, for a lot of people trying to um, pursue what feels like such a strongly felt instinct, um, but hasn't had any um, intellectual framing. Um, and I want to just sort of, um, for from a UK perspective, give thanks to Toby for doing exactly that. Um, and making us all feel more justified and evidence-based for something that felt absolutely instinctive and human. Um, so the Tudor Trust is a family trust. It um, was set up in the 50s, 1950s. Um, most of the trustees are still family members, but sort of third generation, but they take their task really seriously. And it's a strongly relational enterprise altogether. Um, they, tr trustees meet every four weeks, usually for a day and a half, just to look at all of the applications that are coming in, that all of which have been worked up by members of staff as well. So um, within the organization, there's a lot of dialogue, there's a lot of listening, there's a lot of relating. Um, and the, the moment when they took a decisive step in this direction, was about 12 years ago when after a strategic review they had a just an honest conversation whenever they said look we've got these program uh, uh, outcomes our program aims that we're talking about but we just get this feeling because i should say trust works primarily with small community level organizations um, working very much in an embedded neighborhood context um, or, or community of interest context. They said, look, these people are just distorting themselves to fit into our processes and our boxes. Um, and we have this feeling, this instinct, that life's more complicated than that, and that most of the people we feel are most in need are falling between the gaps of all the things that we're trying to specify. If we're trying to do something around health and then we're doing something else around education, and maybe we're doing something else around skills, the people who quite often are most um, in need of the support um, are not falling into any one of these categories, they're falling across all of them. Um, so partly they wanted to work um, with multiple needs, um, which without even saying it, was just having an instinct and getting a bit woke, if you like,
Um, and very, they very quickly had the thought, um, if we got rid of all of our um, programs that comes, what if we just asked organizations to tell us what to do terms, not our terms, um, and uh, share with us what they, yeah, what, what their vision of the world is and what difference in their terms they think they're trying to make or they can make. And so immediately they um, changed the priority and it came from a trust that the people that they were trying to fund knew more about the needs than Tudor as a, as a funded it. Um, and that what Tudor needed to do was to listen um, and to try and really hear what organisations were saying and learn from the organisations about the, the context in which they were working. And then, um, oh, sorry, I'm cutting in and I, I see I've got a bit of a stable, uh, unstable. <clears throat> anyway. yeah. um, so what I'm saying is you can see that this was sort of in a way quite um, an instinctive journey. But along the way, they came across some of the key components that we've been talking about and that Toby's been setting before us. One, the world is very complicated. Two, um, uh, in order to um, do good, you need to build that into your understanding of uh, social action. Um, secondly, that in order to do anything sensible, you need to um, trust people who are able to make the best judgments. So you're not using your judgment as a funder or commissioner, you're trusting the judgments of the people that you are um, uh, backing. And then finally, because it's going to be a journey, because it's complicated, you can't foresee how things will work out. You've got to trust the good intent and the good um, judgment of the people that you're backing so that your relationship with organizations as you go forward through the grant um, through the course of the grant is relational it's not bureaucratic you're not asking people to report certain outcomes at certain points you just have an open line with them all the way through so you're just hearing how things are going so you can adjust as they adjust so in a way they find themselves by instinct into trust-based practice so I posted something to the chat earlier that I'm, I'm is all, just a, a hunch of mine, um, but I'm wondering if it's if it holds up in practice. Which is that the larger the pot of money that's on offer for fixing some social problem, <clears throat> the more likely that honeypot of money attracts a bunch of people who understand how to extract money from large budgets, <clears throat> and the less it attracts people who really have a deep understanding of the problem and would like to work to figure out the problem. So there's this weird when you try to throw a lot of money at solving something that it tends to distort it and screw up the process of fixing it. Does that bear out? Um, uh, I, I absolutely recognize the scenario and that's something that Tudor trustees wrestle with, but they, um, they just have a finely home instinct for love, really, or the um, So whenever um, they're looking at uh, grant applications, if it's looking like some um, unless it's real, they, have, they say we're trying to find the real thing. Um, and I think what that translates into, sometimes they say they're trying to find the right. So developing their own language, I think what they're trying to discern again and again is what Toby says as a kind of um, intrinsic motivation. So they're not, they're not so, they can spot the people who are adept at expressing funders. And Richard. <coughs> My apologies, Richard. Your sound, vo your volume just went down for some reason, and you start. We started getting a little crosstalk, so there's like uh, gremlins or aliens on your line somehow. Um, do you have Do you have earphones you could put in? Uh, yeah, I do. That might act, that might that might help. Uh, it might be echo canceling algorithms that are having a day a field day with us. I don't know. Toby, go ahead. Um, Gary, can I just add one thing to what your question? Because I think Please. this is something that is comes up. I think a lot right now in the field, and there's a lot of frustration from smaller, uh, from people working in community on the ground, uh, more grassroots, especially often communities of color. And they will see these big amounts of money and the big funders, it's, there it's like well we want to support what's happening in community but you're too small to handle our money 
you're you're in a basically we don't trust you to handle significant resources so you you get this entrenched structure of big funding big big institutions look okay we have to find somebody who can handle our big grant and so you set up as you're saying this very strange uh system that makes it uh really hard for these community-based groups to really grow and share their expertise because they're constantly in this cycle of having to prove themselves uh, and it's a real catch-22 so um, I, I just think you raise a very good point um, and can I can I, I the was absolutely recognizing that 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 kind of point about the the, oh, the 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 question that you raised about is there an inverse relationship between kind of trust and size of the money on offer um i also want to offer a slightly different perspective because um uh, in some respects it's easy to see this kind of trust-based practice within a charitable foundations context partly because in some respects the, the governance of charitable foundations is easier if a small group of people decide that they're going to distribute resources in this way, they can just do it. So the trustees decide we're going to fund this way, they decide to fund that way. Um, uh, and also, uh, and that kind of inevitably lends a, a, a kind of size and scale to the amount of resources that, that people are talking about. But one of the things that we were really interested to discover when we did this work is that it can apply as much to the public sector as to the um, as to the charitable foundation, the, uh, the, the not for profit sector or the the distribution of resources from charitable foundations um, and one of the really exciting things was finding public sector people who are distributing resources in a trust-based way and therefore um, also distributing larger quantities of resources in a trust-based way and this is my cue to introduce Gary. Gary do you want to say a little bit about your experience in, in, in this realm. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, so, so I work for Plymouth City Council. So Plymouth's uh, uh, a post-industrial navy town in the far southwest of the UK. It's about 300 miles from London. It's a very poor city um, and historically has always kind of been underfunded by, by central government. So it's always had financial challenge. So our kind of process started in uh, 2012. So in 2012, the big lottery, which is an enormous uh, funder in the UK, uh, is funded from the National Lottery. Uh, a percentage of the money is, is, is put into this essentially charitable funder, but it's actually state run. Um, they, they had a project, they invited uh, uh, 15 cities uh, and they were gonna fund 12, so really high. Uh, potential for success and um, they were going to fund at a basically a million pounds a year for 10 years so uh, and they were really encouraging uh, a kind of bit broad um, uh, a broad collaborative approach to, uh, to to build a bid so so we duly did an enormous uh, three month long uh, consultation where we spoke to about seven or eight hundred people using services their relatives their carers we spoke to them in groups we spoke to them one to one uh, people, people with lived experience designed a lot of the questions we asked and, it, and lo, lo and behold it told us uh, uh, essentially what everyone here is saying that, uh, and really what we already knew that um, the way we did things was um, uh, so in the UK we have uh, a thing called purchase a provider which is based on the new public management model where I the commissioner four times a year I performance manage my services once every three years I essentially chuck a wadge of cash on the table and watch all the services fight over it I, who might be very inexpert in a particular area, uh, decide what's important in that area, despite the fact the people I'm commissioning might have 30 or 40 years uh, commitment and, uh, and experience. So uh, an absolutely crazy system. So, so we essentially uh, prepared a bid, which, which was a trust-based bid about how we were going to uh, we were going to have a confessional phase, uh, uh, and then we were going to move into this really, really collaborative. Uh, trust-based way of uh, funding where where the commissioner was on an equal footing 
you know, we agreed uh, as our kind of match funding to this process that we would, uh, as a as a local government, we would essentially devolve power and budgets to to providers, and we would just be one voice amongst many in in in, in how that money was spent. And um, we we the lottery made lots of encouraging noises. We we, we submitted the bid and and we didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and actually that was the best thing that could have happened so on reflection i think what our group would say is had we won that bid um it would have entrenched the past uh, the, the 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 services that are you know they're really well adapted so some of the large national providers are really well adapted to to, to bidding and securing fund, funding as richard's just outlined really uh, so so we had this absolutely unprecedented a decade of authority of uh, austerity uh we'd failed to get this bid and yet we had this in this really rich um consultation which basically told us we we had to change and so we decided to to continue the process and so at the time that started i, I worked in the national health service and then through government reorganization we uh, we in public health were moved into local government our local political leaders were uh, Labour Party, so essentially a Social Democratic Party, and they wanted to make the city what they called a cooperative city. So they wanted to promote uh, local kind of place-based, um, small-scale uh, solutions in the city. And they, they so, so essentially they were they were casting around looking for something concrete. And I was able to say, well, actually, I've got this thing uh, on the shelf. So this was five years ago. <laughs> I've got this thing which is ready to go. And uh, we've, we've only just ordered the contract five years later. Um, uh, and so what, what they did was they essentially said, okay, you, here's, here's an experimental bubble and you can, you, can do, you can do your thing. So, so our topic is complex needs. So that's people with mental health, substance misuse, offending, domestic violence, um, uh, and homelessness or housing, serious housing problems. Uh, so there are 29 services and there are five separate commissioners. So two national health service commissioners and three local authority commissioners. Uh, and so we went on this, this kind of extraordinary journey of, um, it kind of really started with, um, so we, we, you know, we, we suddenly, we, the, the oppressors <laughs> were coming to the oppressed and saying, Hey, we've changed, you know, it's all, it's all going to be great from now on. And they were like, yeah, yeah okay um so we essentially had to go through a process of of truth and reconciliation where even though you know you might never have been the guy that behaved like that you have to sit there and listen to them tell you what a shit you've been over the years and how you've destroyed their service or you've, you've made things impossible for them or um uh and fine you know so you, you get to a place where you, you you've done that kind of truth and reconciliation then it's about moving on so so we funded uh uh, an academic year of uh, systems leadership for everybody and we did lots of um, lots of uh, what we could would now call storytelling but you, you might call it ethnographic approaches or appreciative inquiry where essentially we we listen to each other and we listen to people using services we were really interested in why people come to work uh, what they like about being at work and similarly why people what people like in their services we found some really fundamental mismatches I think largely driven by a marketized approach where where the kind of things we were valuing you know the, the, the production of data as, to, as toby describes um you realize how meaningless they are to people that that use services and actually to people that work in services um so it, uh, this kind of joint kind of process of of discovery and learning um and um to cut a long story short because there are a lot of people on the call so so essentially we decided to let what's called an alliance contract so an alliance is a is a legal partnership agreement um this is a this is a 75 million pound contract so it's a 10 year long contract um uh, that's kind of an unprecedented time scale in recent years um uh, and the way it works is um uh the other advantage i must say of an alliance contract is what's happened in the uk over the last 20 or 30 years is small local uh, organizations have really been out competed by a kind of supermarketization of, of social care uh, and so there are lots of national providers with bid writing teams and and you often meet this thing which has already been described where they will say you're too small to have this sum of money so 
part of the advantage for us of, of uh, supporting an alliance contract was it enables really quite small providers to to aggregate together and uh, uh, and you know do some skill sharing and, and demonstrate that they can handle those sums of money. So the way the alliance works is that uh, there are um, uh, we're all signatories to the contract, the commissioners as well, and um, the commissioners essentially become part of this unanimous group, uh, a unanimous decision making group, um, uh, where we have essentially all the government money has been put into this. So it's I don't retain any special control over that. I don't I don't retain any any um, magic cheese. Uh, you know, I'm just one of the one of the group, and uh, uh, but because we've spent so long understanding each other's motivation, uh, there's something really important for us, or has been for us in in, in achieving change, is is witnessing stuff together. So, you know, you pair off you know, two two very disparate people, and you go and interview, I don't know, a carer or a family or, or, or whatever. And they tell you stuff which is really moving, and and then later on, when you want that person to stop doing something, you almost always stop doing something. Um, would you stop doing? You can kind of refer back to this this jointly witnessed experience, which moved you, and uh, and it makes it very difficult then for people to to take an entrenched position. They also begin to see that actually this is a really complex system, and and they're only a tiny part of it, and and it's much better if they if they kind of open up. Um, uh, yeah, so so kind of five years later, we we, we let the contract uh, uh, last week, um, and uh, the the boss said, uh, "So that's that done." And, and and I said, "Well, actually, that's it's only it's just about to start. <laughs> We've it's just got us to the start line, really." And uh, she said, "So so so, what's going to happen?" And I said, "Well." I don't I don't know uh, uh, but good things are going to happen because uh, we've got this this understanding and uh, and everyone's really committed and, and we're already you know in the process we've already seen huge improvements to uh, to the experience of people using services we're, 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 you know so we speak to large groups of them every year and they tell us uh, it's things are much better I can't hear you Jerry I forgot to unmute myself. I want to jump in uh, real quick for a second because Trey, it turns out, has to go to a different call at the top of the hour. And I wanted to bring her into the conversation because she's proposing a super interesting project in Colombia, which I described very briefly in the chat. Trey, over to you in the booth. And um, you, you're still muted. Yes. Uh, Jerry, can you just touch on briefly what you want me to talk about? Because I could talk for 50 minutes and I have five. So. <laughs> Exactly. I think, I think <clears throat> given where this conversation is aiming, which part of what your project is, is, uh, is doing <clears throat> sort of is relevant, just bring it in. But the, uh, partly I'm saying this because uh, Trey won uh, kind of a competition for a social venture to re rethink, redesign the, the judicial system in Colombia. And her approach, her team's approach came in with deep listening as the starting point. And as the project team members were out talking to judges and other people in the judicial system, one judge re replied, you know, we've had lots of consultants come through here and they all promise something and don't deliver and you're the first one who's been listening. And built credibility and trust right on the ground, right there. And it was a really simple thing, but very profound. So I think if you can sort of riff on that and pull in any other aspects of it that you want to that, that makes sense in this conversation. Sure. Thank you, Jerry. And I appreciate this conversation so much. It makes me regret that I need to fly. Um, I will give some links uh, as some reference afterwards, if I may, just to economize on time because I don't multitask so well. Um, first of all, really want to continue this conversation. Very much feel that there are kindred spirits here because I think oftentimes those of us who are playing in this sandbox feel alone. So I want to say thank you and, and offer up my gratitude. How I came into this project is, is strange. How I became now the leader of the project is even more strange. I do not speak Spanish whatsoever. I'm Canadian. I'm born and raised in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. I'm as gringa as you get. Um, so from that standpoint, I was very aware that, that this project, if it was to proceed in, in any way, shape or form, and right now the, the proceeding of it is in question, and I can get into that in other conversations later, um, but the, 
If it is to proceed, it cannot be about a transplant. It cannot be about individuals coming in and parachuting in and saying we have a solution. It needs to be a pathway so that Colombians can develop something for Colombians on Colombian soil, plain and simple. So even though we were brought in to, in essence, come in with a tech startup, because that's what they were asking for. They were asking for yet another expensive tech solution um, to help uh, an inefficiency within the justice system is that it became frightfully obvious that, that while we could offer up a part to that, that, that really it had to be more broad spectrum. And so what we did was we merged uh, a methodology out of a tiny little organization out of Tucson, Arizona called Creating the Future. Um, led by Hilde Gottlieb. And um, I've been a member and a fellow of that organization for over 10 years now. And they do what's called now, after much evolution, the catalytic thinking framework. Um, it involves catalytic listening, catalytic thinking, and catalytic decision making, and catalytic action. And so in essence, it involves how we're listening, and how we are asking questions and coming from the place of possibility definition instead of problem definition, because problem definition is actually a zero sum game. A positive plus a negative doesn't equal a positive, it just brings you to zero sum. So in the introduction to doing that, and, and in the application and just the absolutely bare bones practice, I was not the one who who conducted the interviews in Colombia because I don't speak Spanish. I just sat down with two of my teammates who do. One is a Colombian lawyer who actually resides in Bogota. And the other one is a gentleman from Miami who, while he is American, has, has his family history in Colombia. And so between the two of them, with just a little bit of coaching, they were able to get responses that came from the heart, not just from the head. And it was a phenomenal experience. And so just, just passing that on to say, would really love to share contacts. I've already reached out. Um, Gary, I'm having a bit of a hard time finding you on LinkedIn. So if you want to check me out and find, you're not on LinkedIn. Okay, that would, why? That would be why. <laughs> <laughs> um, LinkedIn is usually my go-to, so I have reached out to a couple of you already and would very much like to continue the conversation so, and make connections. So thank you so much for, for the time, and I'm very grateful, and thank okay, you Thank again. you. And I have, a, I have a feeling we have a follow-up call to do just to, to like think about this and come back in with a new set of, of questions and see who else shows up for the conversation. So Trey, thank you for, for being here and for that download. Toby, go ahead. Um, so I, I, I had a, a couple of questions sprung to mind. I mean, I've probably heard uh, probably heard me talk enough, but I just from from your introduction and listening to kind of Gary and Richard and John, I, I, I mean, I'm intrigued by this idea of starting by assuming good intent, um, and because. I think that's probably a starting point for all people, but I, I would be interested to, he, to hear um, whether that was actually this, the case for people or were they making judgments of the trustworthiness of the people that they worked with? So certain people are trustworthy and others aren't. And if so, what the, those trustworthiness judgments were based on? So is it a, we assume good intent and trust everyone, or are we making a set of discernments about who's trustworthy and what isn't, uh, and who isn't rather? And what's the relationship between all all that and the and any kind of trust building work that we do? Because um, Gary, one way to hear the story that Gary's talked about is that essentially they did they have done five years of trust building work. So I'm just curious about the relationship between that idea of assuming good intent, making trustworthiness kind of discernment judgments and building trust purposefully within a set of people. 
so, so Toby, I believe that you're asking that question to the whole group, not just of myself. So I'm just very quickly going to pause myself. I need to run to the door and I'll be right back. Thank you. So my question was was also to John and to Richard and to Gary and anyone else who wants to jump in. So, so, um, so I would say we started from the position of everyone was trustworthy, everyone had good intentions. But I think over the course of the process, you begin to realise that it, I'm, I'm not sure it's necessarily about trust. Some people don't want to do this. Some people are really good at the old way. They get loads of money from the old way and they really don't want to jeopardize that by playing your game and and we took the view as long as they were open about that that was fine because they can you know we can subcontract stuff with them we're not we're not saying it's the end of them um uh, and we we really encouraged people to be to be honest but there were one or two individuals rather than organizations who i mean they're really easy they're really inauthentic and they're really easy to spot and it's you just have a conversation to say look you don't you don't have to do this you can you know you can it's a, this is this is a coalition of the willing you don't you don't you can choose to do something else that's okay the other thing i'd say about trust for us which is a really interesting thing which i actually think you captured in one of the focus groups that um so we were merrily bowling along for two or two and a half years and we 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 were given a savings target because um all UK local government is, is having all of its central grant cut um, between 2010 and 2020. And so we had to fight, remove half a million pounds from the system. And we basically went to the group and said, we have to remove half a million pounds from the system and we want you to tell us how to do it. Um, and, you know, essentially asking turkeys to vote for Christmas. And mm. uh, uh, at that point, uh, there were a couple of services that said, oh, we'd rather you just tell us, you just, you make the decision. We were, no, 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 we, we, we're we serious about this. <laughs> and and, uh, and essentially th they made the cut and they were uh, without any loss of service. So they made, a, they made, they had such detailed knowledge of the system that they were able to find uh, cuts in areas that made no difference to people using the service. Mm -hmm. Cuts that we would not never have been able to, to find. And on reflection, many of the services say it was at the point that we came to them to say we have to cut the money that they realized we were really serious this was a transformational process we were not going to go back to the old ways so there's the stressors kind of help move on the, the system it's an opportunity to demonstrate you are you are doing what you said you would do and that's a, an essential kind of trust building power sharing thing i think um, back to Trey, since I know you have to leave the call. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the situation that we entered into, and, and I will be clear, we are still in, is that uh, absolutely every move we make is suspect. Uh, we're dealing with a culture that has been under 65 years of civil war and has only had peace for the last two years as of November. And that peace is spotty at best. Um, there has been challenges in the Colombian environment with private foreign interests coming in and buying off certain individuals in, within the justice system and within the government. Um, it is a hotbed of distrust in so many ways and there's a lot of um if i was to be kind i i think there is a lot of desire for hope and a lot of skepticism married in with it so one of the things that we are very aware of is that we can't get anybody to trust us we can't it's, it's, not, it's not possible. The only thing we can do is we can cultivate the conditions, the environment, so that individuals can, of their own accord, step into exploring, entertaining, whether or not they might, could, would, should trust us. And really, what they discover in the midst of it is that it has very little with them trusting us and has everything to do with them learning how to trust themselves again. 
And so when we do that, the cultivation of the conditions happens by virtue of the questions that we ask them. It happens by placing them at the center of the design of, of how we design those conversations and how we receive the information. And there's so much more to talk about with that, but I just really wanted to share that a lot of it came down to Enrique and Emerson who, who were being guided remotely by me from Canada. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're glorious, the individuals, um, and willing, willing to step out into the unknown. Um, it really came back to them bringing themselves in check, their motivations, their desires, that they needed to put their expectations 100% aside and walk in in a principled fashion, in a purposeful fashion, but in a neutral fashion. And, um, and that's another whole area of, of conversation. So thank you for your time and for squeezing me in. And I very much look forward to finding out when the next call is so that I can book the whole time off. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Uh, Toby, back to you, wherever you'd like to take us. So I, I, I was um, going to ask that question, the question I asked before of others, so the, it, do you start with that assuming good intent for everyone or do you make those kind of trust discernments of, of, of trustworthiness and how do you build trust between people? I, I'm curious to hear from, from, from John and Richard and others about that as well. And we've got a question from Judy and Richard raised his hand. Richard, why don't you uh, go ahead and address this and uh, then, we can, then we'll go to Judy. Can you, can you hear me? I have my headphones on. And, uh, you do, but your volume is still kind of low, but we hear you better. Oh dear, okay. Um, yeah. But your volume is still curiously lower than it was when you started talking way back when. Oh dear. Um, Are you properly plugged into the jack at the other end? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. I'm pulling you up, but that's not going to make a difference. Um, so I'll hold it real close. Um, uh, uh, you know what? There's something weird that's happening because you're holding the microphone really close. It's not making your volume any louder. So I have a suspicion <laughs> that your earphones are somehow not the source of the audio mic right now. But, but we hear you. We hear you okay. It's just uh, not that loud. Go ahead. I think it might be an, an internet speed thing or something. It's a bit dodgy at the minute. Um, uh, Trey really beautifully um, illustrated what I was going to say, which was, Toby, you were talking about, do you start off with this, you know, this um, uh, trusting of intent? Um, and, and behind that, there's a question really about, um, is this just all these the blind truck here? There's kind of two things. One, first of all, as Trey illustrated, um, it's a, it starts with you being trustworthy. So one of the things that Tudor tries to spend as much time um, thinking about is, are we being trustworthy? What are we, we actually doing? And I guess that's what Trey's talking about. You know, what are the conditions that build trust? Um, and actually being really clear that, um, that people, as they approach Tudor, might not believe that Tudor is going to deliver on what it says, that it really is as open, that it really is as content to try and um, free people as possible. So it's being absolutely clear that you're modeling the behaviors, but not just modeling behaviors as something external. You really believe it when you signed up. You've got intrinsic motivation as well. Um, and then I think, that, I don't know, this might be just building on your question, Joby. Well, first of all, we know that trust isn't just blind trust. It's actually something which is highly discriminatory. Um, we are adjudicating between people we can trust and people we can't trust. Now, a lot of the work I think around trustworthiness so far has been, in, in some extent, um, based on your past record. Um, you've delivered things in the past that demonstrate by your history that you're able to continue doing those things. And I think there's a lot of um, good in that. There's an a, a ethicist, a philosopher over here, um, Honora O'Neill, who's done a lot, of work, a lot of work on trust, breaking it down into those components, really. Um, and it's very simple. Um, but I'm struck that the situation that most of us are finding ourselves in is future-oriented, 
and about things you don't know. So the past is something we can all um, track and we can build up a, a case, but how do you, what new things do you need to factor in whenever you're trying to trust someone essentially to hold their hand in a dark and unknown territory? Most of the complex environments are places that are requiring new solutions. Um, it's interesting, you know, trade work is entirely novel. The work Gary, you're doing is entirely new and exploratory. You're talking about cost based design, so we're talking about the new. So, what extra factors do we need to bring in in complex and unknown environments? I guess shut up. That's really terrific. Thank you, Richard. Really appreciate it. Let me pass the mic to Judy. Well, I'd like to kind of continue on the question of trust because having dealt with corporate restructuring uh, in a different environment than the community one, but it is still a community, I was surprised at the high variability in levels of leadership in their skill at actually listening to one another and thinking at a larger level than their own domain of influence. And so I was curious if you had suggestions um, when you have a group that's intrinsically differing in skill levels as well as previous biases or in self-awareness or holistic thinking. I'm not quite sure how to say what I mean, but you're nodding, so I think you know what I mean. Um, whether there are instructional processes or engagement processes that help move the group to a more cohesive rather than resistant point of view, rather than forcing an external threat? Is there a constructive, positive approach that you've seen that's effective? If I can jump in briefly, I think other people have more practical knowledge than I do, but part of the thesis behind design from trust and the relationship economy and everything I've been working on for 25 years is that the work environment is typically hierarchical, male, uh, controlling, hires and rewards and trains people to hit numbers and not trust other people. I mean, all the functions and filters in the corporate environment, except for the exceptions, and I can point to many really great exceptions that are much more humane and trust the workforce, but the, 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 the typical one uh, is, a, is an environment within which everything we're talking about here is like heresy and potentially threatening to your career track. Because if you're the type A manager who made it to the top by beating people up below you and like beating everybody up the, up the, the hierarchy, um, you're kind of screwed because you have a lot of skeletons in your closet. And the moment you're looking for trust, everybody's like, well, yeah, but you, you crapped on me like five times in the last five meetings. Why are you even bringing this up? So they feel vulnerable, scared, and they're gonna probably double down on defensiveness. And I think one of the interesting conversations here is how do, you, how do you open that conversation so that the person whose background, whose history, as Richard was saying, is not promising in this moment for do I trust you? Um, how can we get to a place where we can trust them again? Uh, there's, a, there's a novel about I, IT called The Phoenix Project. If it, believe it or not, there's a novel about information technology departments and corporations. Um, and it's really good because at one moment, this is a little bit of a plot spoiler, <clears throat> the, the defensive type A uh, executive says, all right, all right, I kind of get what's happening. Let's have a separate meeting about why we're here and where we come from. And he tells his story, which is really like hard. And, and you're like, oh, okay, that was a gesture of vulnerability that opened up that conversation. So I think there's a whole thread we can follow there. Uh, now, whoever else would like to jump in to answer Judy's great question. Uh, well, I'll just jump in quickly, just in response to Toby's and Judy's question. Um, I, we assume uh, good intent, I think, to your uh, uh, question, uh, Toby, and then it's an invitation to, to relationship from there. And I think for us, we kind of our umbrella is approaching um, from a spirit of service when we are going and going, how can we, we see alignment, how can we be supportive of you rather than what do you have to do to prove you're worthy of us? And when we come with that spirit accompanied by a very concrete demonstration of that, unrestricted funding, something shifts right from the beginning, I think, both in terms of power dynamics um, and in terms of a willingness to um, go there. I totally agree with this point about embodying the values you're talking about, 
really, really crucial. Um, uh, and, and, and so just even in terms of our own kind of network and advocacy, that's why we have been finding in-person encounters are, um, are really key. I think the other, um, then the Judy's question, I mean, one thing I think that we have found building trust and empathy is starting from a place of story, uh, often rather than going into the issue or the problem right away. Um, that kind of drops people down a bit um, into this uh, space you referred to, you know, being a little more vulnerable with each other. Um, listening in, uh, in a different way. And then I just end with maybe another way this manifests, I think, within the philanthropic world a little bit. There's so much talk about foundations need to take risks. Uh, lots of risk taking, but and it, two things. One, it's kind of funny because everybody wants to take risks that succeed. Um, and then uh, two, um, how we view risk really is <laughs> around the integrity of the person. I mean, for me, the big risk, would somebody misspend the money or use it to something? That's the risk. The risk that they might fail in what they're doing with a good faith effort, that's, uh, fan we should be supporting that type of stuff. So. It, there's a really strange conversation sometime, even around risk and risk taking within philanthropy that I think um, bringing the, the trust-based frame uh, is important. And, th and then just a final point about the unrestricted funding is it's often if people do provide what's called general operating support or unrestricted, it's kind of seen as a reward for good behavior. Okay, you proved yourself. Okay, here it is. And I get that, but actually it's so fundamentally important to somebody starting out with an idea and something new. Um, so there's just, I, I, I think these things um, uh, plug in a different way. And as a, as a funder, I think coming into these uh, relationships, I think Gary raised a very good point earlier, it is uh, <clears throat> we need to go in and go, this is going to take maybe some time. Um, and because of past history, because of learned behaviors, and we need to be patient and listen. Um, and really listen again. Um, and I just think that can't be uh, stressed enough. Love that. Um, Susan, I think you wanted to step into the conversation earlier. And also, um, we're in our last 10 minutes, so I was going to uh, step aside for a moment and see if the people who haven't jumped in much, uh, Tom, Ken, Jack, uh, would like to say anything. And then uh, for the rest of us, if you want to think about uh, like a concluding, like what, what, do you, what question do you want to leave us with? Because uh, I think there's definitely a call number two here. Toby, you're up for that. <clears throat> um, so let's, let's, let's figure out how to focus that call on things that, that matter to us. Susan, go ahead. Uh, you're muted. Uh, still, there you go. So, um, yeah, I, was, I just wanted to um, call out this question I keep hearing of assume good intent and to point out that just as Jerry uh, started out with this idea that things are very complex and I think they are complex and not just complicated. Um, that the, um, that very, very many people will think that they are, that they have good intent and their good intent is not your good intent. Um, and I just think there's, there's plenty of room to, to sort of get a much more complex view. Um, on that level, I would <laughs> to, um, I, I think your name is Jill, is that right? Judy. Judy, sorry, it just says Jay Benham here. Mm -hmm. um, sorry. Okay, it's all right. Uh, <laughs> is that uh, I have worked both in the not-for-profit and the for-profit, uh, uh, and 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 lots in the not-for in the for-profit world because I wanted to understand how it worked. Because I thought I'm not sure we really understand how these organizations work, uh, and I wanted to underscore what she alluded to at the beginning of her comments, which was that it looks very much like the world that you are in. Mm -hmm. And the techniques that you are talking about are very much 
the things that have worked, when things work. If you study why something worked when it worked, <laughs> instead of why didn't it work uh, when it didn't work, um, you, you get to a different set of, of questions. The, the, uh, the, uh, and I do think, I was just gonna say for our next um, conversation, um, I, I've enjoyed listening to, to this not-for-profit conversation and I wish it could be, maybe it is being recorded and that there is a conservation group that I have recently come to know who, who I would love to have them listen to this conversation you've just had and for them to reflect on their own, on their own um, experiences, because I think, I think they, some of them instinctively know this too. Um, so it could be somebody to add to the conversation. That sounds wonderful. Thanks, Susan. <clears throat> uh, Ken, Tom? That sounds like Tomcat or you know, some compound name, but although I, I don't think you guys are in a relationship, but still. Um, would either of you like to jump in, Tom? Uh, no, thank you very much for the conversation I've got. This is such a broad conversation that could go in so many different directions. And uh, as opposed to um, diving in, I, I would love to have dived in about five different places, but it felt like we'd be pushing the conversation in different ways. So I really enjoyed where we were going. Uh, having worked for the Coca-Cola company on the obesity issue, that one chart that Toby shared earlier was very interesting to me, and I'll be definitely looking into that a little bit further. Uh, but it just reminded me that when you have disparate power relationships for all the different players in a complex environment, uh, and they all have different intentionality, some of their intentionality is overt and some is covert, it leads to very different outcomes. The Chinese government just announced that their way of combating obesity is to emphasize exercise over calorie control. And as soon as I heard that, I kind of knew what was behind that. Wow. And the New York Times just came out with an article showing the nonprofit organizations that were funded by the food and beverage companies that had the influence on the policy. And so this idea of designing for trust brings up the issue of sometimes you don't need to, you don't have good reason to trust each player in the conversation. Um, and then lastly, uh, one of the books I got for Christmas that I'm going to be reading soon is this one uh, by Yasha Monk, The Age of Personal Responsibility. And what it's about is we have concepts that help this guide our discussion, our, our way of thinking that go through society over time. And for the last several decades, our conception of responsibility has shifted from one's responsibility to society and to others to personal responsibility for taking care of yourself. And if you don't, well, tough luck, you don't even get any help from the state or services because you haven't shown that you're taking on enough of your own responsibility. To me, I think this is one of the big ideas that's getting in the way of our ability to trust each other and to trust our, um, the outcomes that we have as a group. I think also this is a really interesting bridge boundary crossover topic because the conservative critique is that people have lost their personal responsibility and we've shifted it all to the welfare state. And other, other people are like, we see that people you know, are, are acting irresponsibly or are not connecting in. So I think this is, a, this is one of those issues where everybody's worried and there might be a, an interesting opening to have that conversation. So I love that you're reading that. Thank you. Yeah, and, and it basically, I think there's a key theme in what we've been talking about today that's very central to this idea too, which is when you see somebody who has a, a poor person begging on the street, he should be responsible for helping himself in one way. But that doesn't negate the social norms and the structural issues that contribute to that problem. So was he responsible for his efforts or was he responsible for his outcome? And where do we as others have contri contribute to those different uh, ways of, of benefiting each other? Cool, thank you. Thank you. Ken? Uh, Judy, go ahead. I was just going to say, to follow on what you just said, there's a really important dimension here that we could explore in another talk about the personal collective boundary that's at the heart of some of these trust issues. Because in the group dynamic, what I've seen is that those are the root causes of the conflict, is the uneven affiliation with the collective point of view. And then that impacts if you're not really engaged in the collective point of view, your ability to trust or be trusted by the group. And 
where that then leads. And so it's, it's a complex dimension, but I appreciate very much you bringing that to the front of the discussion, because I do think the sense of me first that has been a unique character of recent decades in social history, at least here and in other places. And maybe, even maybe even the current presidency. I'm sorry? Maybe even the current presidency, but go ahead. Well, well that's sort of the epitome of the me first uh, atrocities, but I don't want to go there <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for lots of obvious reasons. But I think that, that one of the things I'm trying to understand and work on in every possible situation is trust and collective bonding in terms of cohesion, identifying the points where we have same value, where we can connect to envision what the solution might be, even if we don't agree on how we would get there. Um, anything that kind of increases the connectivity um, is important, given that you have a very diverse audience that's coming from very different levels of awareness and compatibility and compromise capacity and other things. Thank you. Uh, Ken? I'd like to thank everybody. This has been a really fascinating call, and I'm so delighted to hear about your work. It's it's just, you know, it, it stirs me. It, it makes me feel good to know that you're out there doing this work. As someone said, you know, we tend to feel that we're alone, and um, trust is not the primary focus of my work, but as an OD consultant, it's often a big focus of the work. Um, just uh, I threw some notes in there about a book called Trust by Fernando Flores. I think it's Robert Solomon, and I can't remember the other author, but um, you know, this, this idea of there's a compound here of capacity, uh, capability, and sincerity. And if any one of those are missing, you know, you end up with, with a lack of trust. And so many people are so overworked that they, um, they have the, the sincerity and the capability, but they lack the capacity. And so they keep breaking promises, and that erodes trust over time. I'm a person who likes to um, get bodies in the room. So very often when I have a group, um, I will have them line up in a spectrum and do kind of a constellation. I'll put something in the middle of the floor and say, if you totally trust the team, stand next to this thing. And the less trust you have, move further away. And then we pull and say, so why are you standing way over there? You know, And we'll ask, what would need to shift or change for you to move closer into the center? And that can start a really interesting conversation. And the other thing I ask people is, um, if you are the kind of person who uh, normally trusts everybody implicitly, then what would it take for you to dial that back so you're a little bit more skeptical? And if you're the kind of person who, you gotta prove to me that you're worthwhile, what would it take you just to take one step towards, I'll grant you a little bit. And I find that opens up a lot of room for folks. You know, it, it, it depolarizes in a way. So um, the other thing is, is say, you know, before we're going to talk about the things that we know establish trust, but first, what are some things that have happened to you in the past that eroded trust for you really quickly? You name those on the flip chart and people go, well, now we know from our experience, these are the things we don't want to do. And then you say, okay, and when have you been guilty of this? And everybody goes, uh, uh, <laughs> I did that once, you know. And, and so it sort of humanizes and lets us know that it's not about feeling superior. It's, and so normalizing it. Needed to, so that's, that's my small contribution. I've really enjoyed being on this call. And it's, I feel privileged to be sitting with you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ken. Thank you all for, for showing up. I wanted to throw a couple things in the conversation quickly at the end here. <clears throat> One is that the catalytic framework that Trey described earlier um, does this, as does appreciative inquiry, which says trying to solve problems is itself a problem because it creates downward discourse. It's a little bit like your, your, your body goes where your head goes. And if you're looking downward at a problem, you're gonna dive into the problem. So, why not, so this is all about asking opening questions like what is the best thing we could do together? What would it take to get to this aspired future? There's a series of kinds of questions as Ken just showed. That, that reframe how people who have, might have very different opinions can get together and do things. Um, two, we mentioned a couple times in the chat the Kinevin framework. Is everybody familiar with Dave Snowden's Kinevin framework? Um, so see why it's a Welsh word, so of course it looks nothing like it sounds. Um, there's a really excellent video online. I can, I'll put a link to it uh, 
of David Snowden explaining the Kinevin framework, it basically says that there's four kinds of problem spaces. There's simple, complicated, complex, and chaotic. And simple and chaotic, you can sort of disregard simple, the stuff you can automate, it, it's algorithmic. You can say, oh, this is how to do simple. And we're automating the hell out of that. Chaos is, you can ignore because it's so bad, it's temporary. You, you, the organization dies and goes away or it slips into one of the other spaces. The problem, and this is my takeaway from Kinevin, the biggest one is managers don't understand when they're in a complicated space where experts can help you. And when you're in a chaotic space where experts will lead you down the merry path to ruin. And I think what I love about Toby's approach and the approach we're all talking about here is that it's complexity informed, which means it takes as the basis that these thorny, wicked problems in Horst Riddle's language, in fact, um, need, you need to explore your way into a solution. And in order to do that, you need to devolve trust to the people who can have the best judgment. And this goes to Lynn Ostrom's management of the commons philosophies, polycentric governance factors in here, the idea that the closer in you get to what the issues are, and give those people control over fixing it, the more likely you are to fix it. And then there's this other notion kind of on top of this, which is once you've solved this problem, it doesn't mean go to a new community and tell them what to do. It means we need to figure out what's the process to help the next community figure their way through the steps themselves, because solutions have to come from local, the people have to understand it, they have to get to the place where they understand each other's intentions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, Sorry, that was longer than I expected, but I, I think I said it better than I expected too. Um, <laughs> a, a small thing too is every three years I get invited to be a teacher, a uh, faculty at the Public Affairs Institute, which is run by the, the Public Affairs uh, Consortium that basically it's lobbyists and other sorts of people who go in and convince China that, hey, diet doesn't really matter, it's all gonna be about exercise. And it's really interesting because I feel like Daniel in the lion's den there and the people are really smart and our conversations are really good. And I'm trying to wake them up to these things while I completely realize that they're being paid to run the table for large organizations to build policies that constrict the kinds of things that we're talking about. So I think it's gonna be another year, like next January, I hope to be back there and I wanna inform what I do with them a little bit better. Last thing I'll say, and then back to you, Toby, for last words or, or John or Richard or Gary, if you wanna also kick in. Um, the, the design from trust has a little mailing list, a Google group, which I would love to have you all be on. Uh, we can talk there about these issues ongoing anytime at all. It's a conversational mailing list. Uh, and again, let's plan another, another call here, but, uh, let's go back to you, Toby, and then we'll take us out. Um, wow. Uh, so I feel like I've, um, uh, I've really enjoyed the, the conversation today. Thank you everyone for uh, taking part in it. Um, I'm I kind of I've got three thoughts in my head uh, right now. Um, firstly, in relation to the the question of what develops trust, um, I was going to ask uh, Gary to talk about the uh, power of play as a mechanism to develop trust because uh, he, he's got some quite interesting experiences about that. Maybe maybe that's something we could talk about next time as uh, play behaviour as a way to explore trust. Um, I wanted to also reflect on the idea that trust is a radical act. And I really, this hit home to me really strongly from attending the Whitman Institute uh, kind of retreat in, in, in September last year. The radical potential that you get from trusting people, I think is, is, is really underestimated. But also, our, the, it is no coincidence that we have less trust between citizens uh, between those who are governed and those who govern at the moment because it was a deliberate act of sabotage of trust over the last 30 years. And so putting trust, trust back on the table and making, that, making trust building a central part of what we do is an act of resistance to that because the kinds of outcomes we're looking for, the kinds of politics that we want to be possible aren't possible in the absence of trust um, and finally kind of when this uh, moves into the realm of kind of organizational behavior and particularly kind of performance management um, which is my area of study uh, I recently discovered uh, an area of uh, kind of performance management called stewardship theory which is what 
how you do performance management if you assume trust and good intention. And it's been this massively neglected area of kind of organizational study. Um, I, was, I was kind of digging out some articles from 1997 earlier that got some like basically talking about the um, uh, exactly the stuff we're talking about today, but it's never really been implemented. So uh, I can share some stuff about stewardship theory with people and that might be a way, uh, it might be some um, uh, areas for potential future exploration. That sounds phenomenal, thank you. Um, let me stop sharing my screen. Uh, Gary, John, Richard, any last words? Uh, just thanks for the invitation to participate in the conversation today. Really appreciate it. Um, and I would just yeah uh, underscore what Toby said around uh, these are uh, about the radical uh, acts uh, and and resistance. Um, I uh, I would underscore those. Yeah. Thank you. And I completely agree. I, part, of, part of my riff is that we, some parties in the arena have figured out how to weaponize trust and how to turn it against us, how to undermine it systematically in order to win elections. And uh, it's, 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 it's killing us and we have not figured out yet the countermeasures or antidotes or whatever. And I think that framing this as a radical act is a lovely way to do that. I appreciate it. Gary, go ahead. You're, you're muted though. Um, uh, yes, so uh, one of the things I wanted to um, kind of leave with, maybe for a future point, is so in our project, uh, this is both very practical, but also it's symbolic of something very kind of philosophical. So we've reached a point where we are almost unable to communicate with the rest of the new public management system. So we cannot explain to them in words they understand what good it looks like when we speak to the people in our system they say i've never enjoyed coming to work more our sickness rates objectively are lower our dna rates for patients are, are you know are greatly reduced you know on all the objective measures we can see although we don't actually use them as measures um uh it's it's better uh, and people will if you speak to them they'll tell you that but we but in the kind of corporate management world we have we really struggle to um to explain to people why it's better and that that presents for some of our services that, that straddle more than one authority or more than one county. Uh, they, they, they say to us, Plymouth is the best place to work. You know, it's really exciting, it's really radical, uh, but I'm under enormous pressure from my boss because you don't do what we call the RAG system, a red, amber, green rating system. You, you, don't, you don't do KPIs, so how can I prove I'm unable to prove? So, so and similarly, uh, locally when 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 you know we, this idea of accounting which we kind of largely uh don't worry about really we we, we talk about assurance rather than rather than accounting but so, so, so it's, a, it's a huge problem for us this this everything's lost in translation but yeah it's been a great conversation and just great to see you john you're looking really well richard um yeah just to thank everyone for the conversation it's been incredibly enriching to hear um, the depth and breadth of people's thinking and experience. Um, I'm definitely coming away with questions, um, which would be great to continue in the conversation, because I think, um, and it may be just a matter of context because I'm coming at it from a uh, foundation, um, but I think so much of what we've been talking about is about the human qualities of empathy, relationship, listening, um, trust, judgment that's based on knowledge, um, rather than uh, something abstract or proxy. Um, so there's an immediacy about it. So that's the question really. Um, can we talk about trust in anything that, in, in ways that are anything um, other than um, necessarily imply smaller community contexts or small groups of people? You know, how do we take this beyond um, small groups or small organizations um, or small networks? Um, but I just want to kind of have a hopeful thought as well, I think, um, because I feel that trust is infectious. Um, and that if we can't, you know, if we can't control our whole system, um, we must never underestimate our ability, nonetheless, to have a remarkable effect on wider systems just by behaving in a particular way ourselves. Um, because that's the point of systems. You change one part of it, and the whole thing swivels. Um, 
So I think I just want to leave us with that sort of optimistic thought that I have, and you can come back and tell me that's rubbish or pie in the sky, or, or give me some confirmation because it does feel a bit lonely sometimes. Thank you, everybody. Confirmation. Thank, thank you, Richard. Yeah, I, I often describe myself as a short-term cynic and a long-term optimist, <clears throat> by which I mean things in the short run are just going to be very messy because we have all these stresses you know, showing up. And in, in the long run, I think what you're saying is right, that this is catalytic change. It's not, it's not necessarily slow, move the needle, and you know, how many people are, are left in poverty kind of change. This is a sea change of attitude that can, that, and, and, and the, world, you know, the world has seen sea changes happen or, or relatively rapid catalytic change happen now and then. It's very infrequent. And all too often, it's catalytic change toward the worst, toward, you know, toward some, some worse setting for most humans. You, you do not want to be a peasant in any country on earth, pretty much in any time period, because they are squeezing you for blood. Um, and yet, if you want, if you, like the Marsh Arabs way back around the days of Uruk and so forth, were living much better lives than the people in the cities. There's a book, Against the Grain, by James Scott that I highly recommend, where he debunks the origins of civilization. So, so... Let, let's figure out how to, and I'm going to have a call on this at some point also, like let's figure out how to bring forward the best of what we once used to know how to do with the best of what we are now able to do, uh, which is really phenomenal. So I'm just, uh, Toby, thank you for, for being my partner in crime for, for convening this. Uh, the rest of you, thank you for showing up. Let's do another call and uh, sharpen, sharpen the point on some of the things we talked about, but this has been really, really fantastic. I really appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Apologies for having to come in late. I'm glad you were there, Judy. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye.